Certainly, a bigger number of people here than suppliers, but not that much. Okay, and the job room is just me and Mitchell. Yeah. Oh. oh, here's our job scribe. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know, I know. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. uh -huh. So let's start, I guess. All right, hello everybody. This is the uh, DHC working group session. If you're here for that, you're in the right place. If not, you're welcome to stay anyway. Please uh, note the note well. Should have seen it plenty of times. So uh, the blue sheets have begun going around. We uh, would appreciate uh, Jabber and Ethernet pad uh, note takers. Shang is going to be doing it, but anybody that can. Okay. Yep. Etherpad note taker, but if there's Jabber. Okay. Great. Thank you. And you know, people feel help feel free to help out in the uh, Etherpad to add your comments and stuff like that as well. Um, I'm Bernie Volz, one of the working group co-chairs. And I'm Tomasz Mogulski, the other co-chair. And then we have Shang, who is the DHC working group secretary. So uh, the agenda this afternoon is a few minutes of you know, the normal agenda bashing and other things. Then we'll have uh, a, a discussion of the Yang model, relay initiated release, uh, how to move forward on the secure DHCPv6 work, uh, failover, prefix length, and uh, biz discussion. And the time permits, we'll have another late presentation for force renew. Anybody have any uh, issues with that ordering or something? Do we need to move anything? Okay. Just a few comments on uh, the working group status. Um, for you know the status, you can always check the data tracker, and that really is the best place to look for what's uh, happened and uh, what's going on. Most of the documents that we do have actively, um, uh, you know, that we're actively working on, that are working group documents, are being discussed today. A few that are not are the TopoCon. Um, so I did recently update that. Um, I think a few, Marcin has confirmed, uh, you know, and had a couple comments um, on making sure his issues were addressed. I still have to do mine, and I think. It's also, uh, we are waiting for, uh, for confirmation from Jin Mei that his comments were also addressed and we should be ready to go. Right, and then I'll do the working group right up. It looks like we'll probably need another rev just to address Marson's and, and hopefully Jin May's my comments if there are any, um, and then, then we'll send it on. The DHC Access Network Identifier um, needs to clear a few IESG discusses. Um, I think at least the last status was that the authors did attempt to, a couple of times to follow up and are waiting response. I don't know. Any of the other co-authors are here that might add anything to that, but I think hopefully that will clear shortly. Um, the privacy issues, past working group, last call. Uh, there were some comments received. The anonymity profile document's been updated, and the two privacy drafts still need a few updates. And uh, then we'll do, you know, make sure that all those people that had raised issues, their comments are cleared, and then I, I have to do the write-up, and we can send it off to the the IESG. Um, well, our AD will send it off the IESG. One other um, note, and uh, you know, for those that have an interest here, you may want to attend the MIF working group um, tomorrow because they will discuss this tomorrow morning. And that is, there is an IPR issue that came up on the um, 
TBD, DHCP support draft. So they have, will have to look at that that issue because that just recently uh, came up. And if anybody has any, uh, you know, comments one way or the other, either attend that or send them on the mailing list because I think they on their mailing list, not. I mean, you can CC ours, but it, it's for the MIP working group to decide what they want to do with that document. Okay. Also, a brief summary of the DHCP hackathon that uh, happened uh, uh, during the previous uh, weekend. So it was the <coughs> excuse me, it was the second uh, DHCP hackathon. Uh, so this time we focused on uh, DHCP 4 over 6 implementation. Uh, we had a couple of uh, prototypes in different stages of development. <coughs> uh, seven people uh, participated. So and uh, it was very good to, you know, focus on the running code in the rough consensus and running code. Uh, so the links to the source code that we developed during the hackathon are on the slide, so if you are interested, you are more than welcome to download and play with them. Uh, what was also good, we didn't find any spec issues, which is great because the spec is already published as uh, RFC. Uh, we managed to do the uh, interop, so two local implementations, uh, server and, and a client were working correctly. Uh, we had some issues with the second pair. Uh, the issue was that the client was in Germany, so, <clears throat> You know, it's good if the client and server are on the same continent. But yeah, uh, uh, so anyway, uh, we are looking forward to the next hackathon. If you have any ideas what you would like to uh, to test and hack, uh, please send this to, to the mailing list. Uh, for now, it seems that uh, the next hackathon will be focusing on Yank implementation. Okay, so let's start with the first presentation. Uh, just for completeness, uh, we are reminded that we are supposed to uh, tell the presenters to uh, stand in the pink box, but there is no pink box, so please ignore it. Uh, this is Lin Hui from Tsinghua University and the young models for DSCP v6 configurations. And the major changes since last Prague meeting. First, we omitted the feature structure because that it may confuse people and resolve the DUID issues using a, a, some kind of regular expressions. And we also added new or standard uh, client options, but this need, uh, but I think that we will do another way in the next version. So this will be discussed later. And also added some kind of interface config and we also have received some figure from the browsing, so we also need to refine this. And now our model could just pass the PM validator without any errors or warnings. And we did some comparison uh, between our models, and we also received some comments. Uh, the comments from Huawei, uh, they said that we should have a relay, relay server group uh, it is important in the carrier network. So, Bing, Leo, Leo, do you, you want to say something about that? About the relay server group? Uh, Bing Liu from Huawei. Uh, yes, uh, in carrier network, this is an uh, important mm -hmm. feature. But uh, I guess maybe it's not, um, you're considering yeah, but other, my personal other idea other is that I would not prefer to do this because this is some kind of general model of the DLCP v6. We do not just consider the carrier network. We could deploy DLCP everywhere, the enterprise campus. So Okay, no problem. And as the IP pool as a separated module, I think that a grouping may be better. And also the generic form we will discuss later. And I also did some look at the ISC Kia server and I also have the offline discussion with, uh, with the, so you want to say something? Xin Huawei. Um, I just heard you say it, you are not concerned with DHCP deployment in carrier network. No, nope, I'm not just saying that. I said that this model is some kind of general model. It should be deployed in 
carrier network, enterprise network, campus network. Yes, so, but mm -hmm. that means you should cover all the aspects from different scenarios, including both mm -hmm. and carrier network and uh, uh, yeah. enterprise network. But then, why don't you cover the Genesis server group? I think this should be something more vendor specific. Th that is what I prefer. I'm I mean, sure. you, uh, uh, if if that's vendors, yeah, because no, no, I don't think that's vendors specific. That's the carrier networks specific. Yeah, I, uh, you could say that. That's not vendor specific. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Bingley, okay. Uh, it's just repeat Sean's comment. It's not a vendor specific feature. Uh, I think there are two approaches. One approach is in this model we support all possible features, either from the carrier or from home net or some other scenarios, or we just define the base model to support only the common features. So um, I, I think either way is okay. So if you want to follow the, the latter way to define, only covers the common feature, I, I think it's also okay. Yeah, I think maybe we should just focus on the basic specification, so yeah. Uh, Ian Farrer. Um, so we spent a bit of time talking about this yesterday, and I, uh, it was not really clear for me from the from the review comments what what are we talking about here when we talk about carrier specific functions and uh, and and definitions in there. Um, you know, actually, actually, it might be it might be an idea. Could you could you go to the slide just after it? I, I don't want to hijack your presentation, but um, so if you go to the next slide, there's there's a proposal here. No, not that, this one here. No, this one. There's a proposal yeah. that we came up with about how to um, how to tackle what I think was the, the question that you raised here, and I, and this is to implement the generic option formats that are defined in uh, 7227 as part of the things that are available. So, I mean, in in the light of the problem that you've raised, do you think this this resolves that problem for you? So, Leo, you want to say something? So the, the question was, do, is the proposal we have on, on this slide, slide four, does this resolve the problem that you, you raised in your review comments? Sorry, I don't think there's uh, any I think that's the, you, you just read these comments on the mailing list that you said you want some more general option oh, formats, okay, okay. right? So, but we still think that the detail list is helpful. So we modify this to propose that uh, for the new standard or some kind of custom options, we will use this way. Uh, but for the uh, current uh, standard options, we are still using the detail list. So uh, which one is the customized option? I, I don't see it in the slide. So option 5.8, you can put a string into there. You can do. You can do. Uh, no, sorry, it's the variable length one that you can. You can put in essentially what you want because this is something that really is between. You know what you configure the clients to understand that as being. Oh. So you know that, that's the, the concept behind it. That you can you can just treat it as being a binary blob if you want. Okay, I think I need to examine it later. I mean, oh, yeah, continue yeah. in the mailing yeah. list. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, great. So, uh, Bernie Volt. So I, I think it might be worthwhile if you did put something about you know what is the the intended in, intended coverage of this model right i mean you know what's your sort of scope is it for a you know i mean you could be doing a model that would address you know and then it's harder to talk about these things as you have client relay and server but you know if it's a client is it like a cpe client or is it meant to be um you know windows client and the servers too it's it's I think that might get into this question about is it for the carrier networks or not, is to try to figure out what the sort of your, what you're trying to model, you know, what the scope of the model is and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that, you know, how to clarify, make that clear though. Um, Ian Farrell, so I, I mean, when we originally sort of started to put this thing together and think about what would need to be contained in there, we wondered, you know, is this the case of saying, well, you, you want to configure a DHCP server on a, um, say on a CPE, um, and that might be very different to an enterprise um, or you know a carrier network, whatever whatever else. But um, 
the fact is the thing that should make this different is the scaling. And I mean, you know, if, if you start to go down this line, you're, you're, you're going to get into problems about saying, well, what's carrier grade DHCP and how is this fundamentally different from consumer grade DHCP? Um, you know, as long as if you have a model for defining a pool, if you have a model for, you know, a way to do address reservation, these things are all common functions. The only thing that, that varies really is, is how much of it, you know, that, uh, that you need to do. Well, some of it also depends on the complexity, right? Because there, there are, you know, sort of large scale DHCP servers have a different complexity than the, the, the sort of smaller stuff that's meant for you know, I mean, if, if you were just doing like a C, mm. CPE DHCP server, you might just focus on, for example, information requests because you're not necessarily doing address assignment. I, it's just an example yeah. of, and I think that's something that I think just deserves some consideration. You know, are you are you handling prefix delegation? Are you not? Things like that. You I, know, I, I and, mean, and yeah. there's also this this model kind of breaks down very quickly because most, you know, you have to have a way of defining complicated options because most options today are not probably going to be these simple, you know, singleton type of things. You know, they may be a multiple, you know, like, like, you know, we're just in the last, in Softwires, right? And your, mm. your option has, uh, uh, um, you know, 16 bit integer followed by an eight bit integer, for example. Well, but, but uh, I mean, in that case, the model does spell out exactly how that needs to be laid out. And, you know, it has, um, it has, it has no, so that you can fill those things in directly with the relevant descriptions around that. I mean, I, I think an interesting thing from what you suggest there, we've, you know, we, we've been looking for reviews and we've been looking really for uh, server vendors as, as being the targets for, for reviews, but it would be an interesting task to look at CPE implementations as well and say, you know, to say, we think the model will scale up, but will it scale down? Yeah, that's that's a good point. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So, let's continue. Uh, I think uh, we have already already finished this part. So, next steps. We will still continue to look at other implementations, just like what we have done for the Kia. And so, any volunteers who just So what was that take? Can you speak up? You're willing to do, look at the nominal implementation you said? Yeah, I need to compare this to the nominum implementation just to make sure that there aren't any bizarre little edges. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. So any other comments? Mm -hmm. I did review that. I sent my mm -hmm. comments to the list yesterday. So yeah. uh, um, it's, it was not the full review of the full document. I've mostly focused on the server and partly on the client. Um, I will, I promise I'll continue reviewing it as the document progresses against the implementations that I am uh, involved in. Yeah, thank you, yeah. Okay. So I think that's all. Okay, okay. thank you. Okay, next is Sunil for the relay initiated release. Yeah. Hi, I'm Sunil, uh, Sunil Gandhiwar from Juniper Networks, presenting relay initiated release. Oh, go the other way. <coughs> um, so just to give a little background, um, with uh, DSCP, we get an IP address and some uh, configuration information, but a lot of things happens in the network before a uh, client can really access the network. For example, the service provider uh, brand, uh, broadband network gateway creates a logical interface and programs some uh, routes only through these routes, the client can really access the network. So without the routes added, access routes added, even the client can send the packet out, but it will not be able to receive any packets in. So to access the network, it, these routes are needed. So similarly, there are a lot of things happens in order to receive the services to the client. And um, so these resources are needed on the relay 
server as well as there could be some more network devices which provide services to the subscriber uh, so if we see that the how many subscribers to be provisioned on a box is is determined by two things one is the availability of the addresses which are limited in ipv4 but plenty in ipv6 and the number of resources on the broadband network gateway itself so so that determines the the subscription on a on a box um, so these are the some of the statistics i've collected from service providers so i kind of uh, pinged few service providers and uh, their customer base is ranging from 5 million to 35 million um, and they they provide a typical lease period as uh, 24 hours to 48 hours <clears throat> Uh, what they typically told is the administrative binding cleanup is needed many times a day um, and administrative cleanup for the entire subnet is uh, kind of once a week in you know, one or more areas um, to bring the, uh, the, the chain of relays in sync. It kind of is needed a few times a week. Um, client device replacement uh, is approximately one to four percent a month. Um, so for an average of uh, 20 million subscriber base, uh, it's around 200,000 to 800,000 a month. Uh, and uh, their statistics also told more than 95% of the clients never send a release at all. Uh, the subscription rate they, uh, they provide on a box is at the most three fourths of the capacity of the box. So if the capacity of the box is half a million, they can subscribe at the most 375,000 subscribers on that box. So this is a typical broadband age uh, network where either a relay, one of the relays, or a server is located on the broadband network gateway itself. Um, and these are the, some of the problem scenarios. Uh, the, uh, in between client and a server, there are multiple relays and administrative administrative cleanup may be needed in in some of these uh, devices so uh, it could be because of the you know some operator decision that you know they want to clean some clients or it could be to protect against some bad behaving clients or there sometimes to conserve resources from the subnet uh, they need to clean up the entire subnet um, so administrators need to access each one of these devices and clean up the bindings, which is a very cumbersome process. Um, another scenario uh, for the service provider is to, if one of these DSCP devices is out of sync with respect to some binding, then they again need to you know, uh, find out which device it is or which subscriber it is and clean up the subscriber on each one of these devices. Then the third scenario is the device itself is replaced. It could be because of the multiple reasons the client device could be failed or it could be upgraded or um, change in service plan or something like that. In that case, the device itself is replaced. So uh, if it is replaced, the so old device uh, will hold the binding, will hold the resources as well as a new device. So at one point of time, there's more than one device holding the resources, which are, as we saw, are limited. Uh, another scenario, in, in some of the network uh, configuration where client keeps moving across, so uh, at one point of time, a client may hold, again, multiple uh, leases for, uh, you know, uh, even if it is not using, it is not sending the release, and so it is holding more than one resource. Um, another scenario is in case of busy Wi-Fi uh, uh, centers where uh, subscribers keep, uh, clients keep coming in and out, so walk in and walk out, and then, you know, there's no optimal lease period which to give. So again, you know, there's very inefficient use of resources at, uh, in that case. Another scenario, as we saw, 95% of the clients never even send release so it's kind of an inefficient use of resources. So need, they need protection, uh, protect the resources against this bad behaving client, which do not send the release at all. So this is the problem statement kind of, you know, um, kind of combining all these scenarios together. How to conveniently clear bindings administratively. 
how to handle the out of sync network node, how to release unused binding and use resources optimally, how to enable higher subscription per broadband network gateway, that is clean up old leases where client is holding multiple leases like moving or, um, or the replaced devices. So if we see that service providers are, you know, kind of because of mul uh, client holding multiple leases, they're forced to reduce their subscription rate. And uh, typically, uh, uh, if if uh, if a box can, you know, subscribe half a million, it can take maximum three uh, three seventy five thousand subscribers. Actually, this is the maximum. They even reduce more than that. Um, the bandwidth may be still available on that gateway because. The bandwidth uh, is in, in some terabits and they oversubscribe always. So it is like 10 is to one for residential subscribers, four is to one for uh, business subscribers. So bandwidth is available. Only thing is they have to under, sub, under provision on a box, uh, which is wasting uh, their resources on the box. Here are some of the existing solutions. Uh, one is the suggested by a uh, few folks on the mailing list about the short lease. So it is, it is a great solution, but in case of broadband network gateway, it is not really scalable. Uh, the reason being, uh, the usually the, the rate is 500 calls per second, that is 500 logins per second. So not only the DORA or uh, solicit access and all, uh, solicit advertise, but also it needs to create the you know, interfaces and apply the policy, cost, access routes, all that. At the same time, need to also handle 500 logouts also at the same time. Um, also, it's, it's being a service gateway, it needs to provide services, uh, you know, subscribe, whatever subscriber had provisioned. So it has to go to the radius and, uh, sir. Christian Wittema, Microsoft. Uh, I see your point about the number of calls per second, but do you have statistics about the duration of the user sessions? Um, I do not have how much time a subscriber remains, uh, but I have statistics about uh, you know all uh, all the previous ones which I had. These are the statistics which I could, which I had collected. I mean, I did not realize how long the subscriber remains. I can, you know, um, because, try to get that. Because what you're describing is that you find it problematic to handle handle subscribers that move too soon. Okay. And they, they they move, and then they, you you keep having resource allocated, and then you say, if I make the the session very very short, uh, it, it's going create too much load on my server, it won't scale. At the same time, to defend the document, you would need to know, I mean, if those clients were doing a clean end out, you would have the same rate of uh, uh, client disconnection that you have here, okay? So to do this engineering uh, and to convince us, I'd like to see the statistics about how long do clients stay, I mean, do 95% uh, of clients uh, remain online for 48 hours that like you have here? Or is it uh, that 50% of them stay less than two hours? I have no idea. And that would change enormously the, the, the kind of engineering you need to do. Uh, so right now, um, since the client never sends the release, so some service providers have a keep alive kind of mechanism to check whether the uh, the client is there or not, or some of them just go by the behavior. Like, for example, one of the thing it says that to you know whenever they find a high utilization of the addresses on a network, like you know the uh, so at that time they have to they are forced to clean up that entire subnet. Uh, so it is all right now manual, and you know so that's why there are no statistics right now. It's all heuristic based. That okay, oh I find that new subscriber is not able to log in, and so they are going back and uh, they, are, they are manually cleaning it up. Uh, Suresh Krishnan, just to clarify for Christian, like one of the things is it's not about like how long the client is keeping the lease, but there's some use cases where there's like CPEs that are getting replaced. 
it's like how long more after they get replaced do they have the lease? So there's one of the problems they have is like the amount of V4 space that they have. So they had to over provision for like uh, some percentage because there's people who are replacing CPEs, but they're not releasing the old lease. I understand that, Suresh, but precisely that that percentage of over provisioning is directly linked to the, the the relation between the duration of the lease exactly and the average duration of the session exactly. So if you do not have statistics on the duration of the session, and something that tells me that it's not something I can I could solve simply, I said, well, why do we need another mechanism then? Okay, exactly. Good point. Thanks. Ted Lemon. Um, so, what is the um, possibility of fixing this? Are, are, are the devices that we're talking about devices that are um, unupdatable, or can they be updated? Um, uh, so, in different service providers, uh, this is you know variable, uh, different varying service provider statistics. So. In some cases, like if it's a set-top box, it's replaceable. Um, in case of like modems and uh, and such devices, those are replaceable. So I didn't mean to replace the device. I just meant to update the firmware on it. Yeah, even in uh, if it's firmware, then the then the uh, uh, MAC address or or its ID is remaining same, and it's not right. replaced now, in that case. Yeah. So the reason that I'm asking is because um, you know we had a. a, a I kind of flip-flopped on whether or not I thought this was a good idea, as you may recall. And um, one of the things that, that would make me feel a lot better about this would be if there were some way for the, um, for the uh, device that's getting the lease to signal that it's going to behave in a way that is consistent with, uh, with what you're proposing, which is to say, if it uh, finds itself disconnected from the network, um, it will not assume that it still has its lease. Uh, when it reconnects. So it will always do a DHCP discover. It will never do a, a DHCP request broadcast, that sort of thing. Um, and I think that that would make me feel a lot, if, if we were able to specify that, I think that would make me feel a lot better about this proposal. So in other words, if, 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 uh, if it doesn't signal that it does, that, it, that it's willing to behave that way, then, um, then we don't reset it. And, you know, of course you can always override that in the server. So. <laughs> Correct. So if there is kind of a keep alive, which is going between client and uh, relay or, or, or some kind of a mechanism where DHCP client knows that I'm disconnected from the network and I'm reestablishing. So it is kind of applicable to only those clients or those uh, set of uh, uh, service provider or in the network where client knows that it is going to reestablish itself whenever it is getting disconnected from the client. And uh, this is mainly happening in those service provider cases where they are migrating PPP subscriber to DSCP because DSCP is becoming the versatile now. So in those cases, those clients know that they need to reestablish whenever there's a disconnect on the network. So, so to, 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 to reinforce Ted's point, make a thought experiment that there is no relay that basically you have a, a gigantic subnet and that your, your CPs are directly speaking to the DHCP server without a relay, which would be immense as, as a sort of experiment. Of course, we don't deploy like that. If you did that, you could say, okay, my proposal is equivalent to saying on some condition, the server that has given a lease to a client is gonna unitarily decide that, ah, no, I'll give that to someone else. What do we need to make that factory reasonably safe and to not have uh, the client still believe that they have a lease and reconnect and somehow get all messed up? Uh, so as I understand I, your question, you are saying that there's no relay in the network, there's only server. I, and... I, I say as a soap experiment, okay? Suppose that there is no relay. Okay. But uh, the, the, the client has been directly in contact with the server. Okay. He says, hey, give me an address. Yeah. The server gives him an address. And then the server, for whatever reason, decides that, yeah, I'm giving that address to these guys for four days, but uh, obviously he doesn't use it, so I'm gonna reclaim the address and give it to someone else. What do we need for that to be safe? Uh, because so it's the same problem, in fact. So it's like a failover server, right? It is going to another server, is that what you're saying? No, it's maybe to just reconnecting three hours later and 
reuse, not, not refreshing the list because it already has it and just using it. So uh, it is basically again recontacting the same server and it's sending the discover. It's not recontacting the server. Okay. It's just plugging back on the network and starting to send packet from the address it has. Okay. So basically, client is remembering that if I have the lease already valid and I'm kind of reusing it, right? It's yeah. operational. Yeah. yeah. So in so um, this draft will not be applicable if the client is going to remember the lease after it wakes up. So. Uh, I'm kind of specifying that in the applicability that it is applicable only on the networks where client is going to reconnect, re, recon, uh, every reconnect it's going to reestablish the, the DSCP. The circuit is going down for it and only if it is going to reestablish it's applicable only in those scenarios. So Ted Lemon again, uh, so, first did you want to? See? Yeah, just yeah, go ahead. Uh, so, Rish Krishnan. So, like, just to answer one thing to Christian, like, there's there's one subtle thing that I don't think it's not it's not clear in the draft, but like, a bunch of us had a chat with Sunil to figure this out. Is that there's like a link layer connection to the relay. So, the link layer, when the link layer connection goes down, it knows the CPS disconnected, right? So that's the only case in which it pulls it down. So when the link layer comes back up, you set up your PPPoE again, and then you set like you do your DHCP or any address mechanism. So what you say is exactly true, except that it's like some additional information the relay has, the DHCP server, unless it's directly connected with an Ethernet cable, doesn't have, right? Which is that the link connection has gone down. That's it. I just wanted to clarify that. Uh, Ted Lemon again. So that's a really useful clarification. I think um, what would make me happy in this uh, effort would be to have uh, the draft specify that the client signals that it that it's that it knows that this this arrangement exists. That when the when the link layer goes away, it, lo it automatically loses its lease, um, and that would to me that's the right thing for people to implement. Now, maybe that in the short term, if you have some devices that aren't doing that, you might you know sort of fudge it. But but I think that the actual right solution is to specify it that way, so that we all you know we all know what we're doing. We're all consenting adults, and everything works out. And and uh, you know, and then if you want to do something a little bit different operationally in your network, then that's okay too. Sure. So, yeah. uh, Bernie Bulls here. I, I think, you know, it's kind of interesting because the link layer goes down, right? And, and, or the virtual circuit goes down, has to be reestablished. The BNG can already get rid of the state because it doesn't need to retain it, right? So it's a question of just does, is, what's the benefit for the server to get rid of the state, right? Because, I mean, if, if the BNG is saying once that circuit goes down, I can't talk to you anymore, you know, and if, if you, so it's a quite, I mean, a lot of these arguments are for, for improving the scalability of the BNG, not about improving scalability of the server, and the BNG can already get rid of that state, right, because it doesn't need it anymore. And it can refresh it when the circuit comes back up, the client will either do some DHCP request, whether it's an init, init reboot, or whether it's a whole, you know, discover sequence or, or solicit sequence and either the server gives it the same address because it still has it or it doesn't so i think some of the motivation here is is misplaced because you know you're talking about improving the scalability of the bng and this has little to do with it right because and it even uh, so there is you know the the case of a subscriber replacing his equipment with some other equipment probably, I mean, unplug it and plug it back in takes the circuit down, right? So again, if you're talking about trying to conserve because you have very few addresses to give uh, clients or something like that, that's a different kind of, that, that's a different scenario where this relay initiated release makes sense. But in the BNG case, and if that's your argument that you want to scale the BNG, I'm not sure why it's needed. And I have a little concern with the signal just because the, you know, whatever option or something that says, hey, I can do this and I won't use the address. Part of the problem is, is in some environments, you know, depending on which clients you're talking about, if they give you that signal, but they may not have the signal, you know, I mean, take, you know, and, and like, so there's, yeah, you know, in Doxis, there's a cable modem and there's a CPE, right? The link between the CPE and the cable modem isn't necessarily, you know, you don't know what it is, right? It could be in the same device, in which case the signal is available. It could be, you know, four bridges between the two, and then you don't know whether that signal is available. That that was my 
next question actually because i mean you want to tweak your behavior based on something going down and you feel it's safe because both hand knows that it goes down but there are plenty of error cases where one hand believes it is down and the other one doesn't know it that's right it's uh, but, but in the case of the virtual circuit right that has to be re-established no. so it you know that there's probably a circuit level negotiation that has I, to happen. I, I get that, but in, in order to enforce that you go out of the one, one guy is disconnected and the other guy doesn't know it, to both agree on that next step, you, you need some mechanism. Right, and that's why I think if they're just trying to clean up the BNG, they can do that when the circuit goes down because that client cannot communicate using that address until the, another circuit comes back up. Yeah. Right. The, the services could be distributed in the network. So what they do is they deploy multiple relays till the server, wherever the services are, and that relay is a stateful relay. So it maintains the state. And so whenever the client is circuit is going down, each one has to, uh, you know, disconnect or clear the binding and you know remove the services. And so when the client comes up, everything has to be well, established. So in, in if, if only the first BNG removes the the binding. Well, it will be out of sync with respect to the rest of the chain. Right? Okay, but the other problem you have is if you're trying to use something like relay initiated releases, right? Mm -hmm. The problem is, is that, you know, it's UDP based, it's unreliable. And so how do you know, in, in this case, how do you know that each of those relays got the message, you know? And some may have, some may not have. So the, the relay so, initiated release is a two way handshake. So it is sending the, uh, you know, relay request, a release request to the server. And only when server finds it is sending the X. So um, that is how it is making sure that uh, it is coming from the server, not just relays cleaning it. So it is going to the server. Server makes sure that okay, it is done, and then it is sending the AG back to the first relay. Only when the first relay receives the AG back, it is clearing the binding. So at that time, everybody who is receiving the AG, they are cleaning that. So it is kind of handling the scenario. Okay, so we have to wrap this up. We are already over time for like okay. nine minutes. Thank you. Okay, next. So there, there's a lot more slides that you can go over, but you can look at them online. Did you see, the, see them online? Yeah. Okay, so the next uh, item on our agenda is uh, actually a block of presentations about uh, DHCPv6 security. So we have uh, 30 minutes for this. Uh, I will do in the initial uh, introduction slash uh, discussion summary, uh, and then uh, Lishan will take over and uh, she will go over the uh, details of the actual drafts. Uh, so a bit of history, we've been trying to define security in DHCPv6 for a very long time. So I did some digging or archeology, span you might call it. Uh, so it started in 2008. Uh, this was the initial version. It was adopted, uh, went through multiple revisions. And then finally in uh, 2013, it uh, hit uh, IASG. So at the time it was rejected uh, with the very strong recommendation to rewrite it without using CGAs. So Schenk and co-authors uh, did as requested. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, and then the updated version that, uh, that we have now uh, appeared. So it was adopted, then uh, uh, edited a couple times in, in the normal uh, work group life, life cycle, then last called and uh, it was sent back again, again to ISG in uh, January 2015. Significant changes were uh, requested during uh, uh, AD review. So in particular, uh, two uh, major elements were requested. So the first one was uh, that the threat analysis were missing. And another one was that the use cases are not really clear and uh, it would be good to have the use cases specified and have good applicability statement. Also in the process, uh, uh, Randy Bush got involved and things became slightly more interesting. <clears throat> so uh, just uh, 
just for the recap, uh, this is the state that was uh, uh, state of matters a couple of days ago. So we had uh, three drafts. Uh, the first one, uh, uh, DHC, uh, secure DHC PV6. So it uh, defined certificates and public keys. Uh, there was TOEFL trust on the first use. Uh, it was authentication only. We had another draft that was uh, uh, in the individual submission phase. Uh, it was DHC PV6 encryption. So we defined uh, different public keys. Uh, it was encryption only and there was uh, no authentication. There was also a draft uh, that was called uh, Secure DHCPv6 Deployment. It was also an in, in individual submission. Uh, it was first attempt to at, uh, uh, describe the threat model and deployment scenarios. And this draft was, uh, let's say, immature. Okay, so <clears throat> we had a, uh, a group of people, uh, authors of uh, those drafts, uh, uh, Ted Lemon, uh, Randy Bursch, uh, uh, Bernie and I, and uh, a couple other people, we met uh, a couple of times and uh, discussed the matter. So uh, what were the issues that we were experiencing? So, so the first one was uh, uh, that we really should go forward with a single solution uh, instead of uh, doing uh, separate solutions. So the question was whether we should include the encryption. And there were a couple of reasons uh, why w which uh, led us uh, eventually the decision to uh, to include the encryption. So there's the matter of uh, uh, pervasive monitoring problem and uh, recommendations uh, made in other RFCs. Uh, also, there's a question that if we are not going to uh, 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 to do this, uh, the, the unified approach, then vendors will uh, uh, do the, the least amount of uh, required work to claim that uh, their solution is secure. Uh, and another aspect is that uh, without encryption, if you are going uh, just with authentication, this is a significant privacy uh, uh, leak because you are basically sending proof that this is me with all the details in, in the certificate. And another aspect is that uh, right now, if you start to do encryption, that means that, hey, you have something to hide, right? Uh, so the encrypted traffic uh, stands out. And, and, uh, and final reason was that uh, when you have the whole authentication implemented, doing encryption is simple because you already have all the information. So that's why the decision was to uh, include encryption in the, uh, in, the, in the solution. So the next uh, issue that uh, we were discussing was whether we should uh, keep those uh, two mechanisms specified in uh, separate drafts or uh, keep them together. Uh, so it, one of the reasons why, to, uh, why we uh, thought that combining them is better because it might be confusing whether uh, both of them are man mandatory. Can we do just one? Can we do the other? And also there was a very significant overlap uh, between uh, those two drafts regarding uh, functionality. So the decision was to combine the drafts. Uh, okay, so another issue discussed was uh, whether TOF or trust on the first use uh, uh, so Randy said that it's very tricky to get it right. So, because what does mean uh, trust on, on the first use? What does the use mean? Uh, whether when it's uh, first received or uh, is it uh, 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 accepted automatically? Uh, is the user expected to confirm this somehow? Uh, and also, if if the solution had tofu. Uh, this could be an excuse for operators to skip the necessary setup for security. Okay, Christian? I, I think that's a very sensible development. And uh, I also think that having a deployment draft is a very good idea. And I would encourage seeing work on that because there are, there are plenty of points that are not obvious and that will appear once we start working further on this draft. Uh, in particular, from my personal implementation experience, there is one nasty problem with DHCP security is that 
when you are moving around, you don't know to which DHCP server you are speaking until you have spoken to that DHCP server. So there is a huge issue of identity bootstrap that you don't know who you are expecting to speak to. Like for example, you, you take your, 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 your laptop and you plug the Ethernet cable in a plug. Do you know what DHCP server you expect to, to speak to? And, and so I'd like to see a, a, a very um, deep deployment model there so that we understand those issues and understand what we do. Because otherwise, I mean, there are all kinds of, I authenticate the server, but I don't know which server I expect to authenticate, et cetera, which are interesting. Okay, Randy? Randy Bourgeois, Jay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I confess to making trouble. Um, also, I'd like to back up just a bit. The reason not to do TOEFU, one reason not to do TOEFU at the moment was, as the IESG review said, there's not a um, deployment constraint. There's not a what's the environment, et cetera. And so we backed up and said, <clears throat> If we take a enterprise-like environment where we can have credentials that we acquire out of band, et cetera, we understand. And we can do what you're saying, Christian, which is have some authentication who the hell that DHCP server is and kind of reduce the monkey in the middle problem. So, it's not that tofu is the enemy of the working class. It's just that tofu greatly expands the space and we don't understand it well enough yet. So constrain for the moment. I don't think we're disagreeing. I, I think we agree. I mean, I, yeah. I, was, I was reviewing the draft, the deployment draft and saying, hey, tofu is interesting, but tofu means that you are going to be taking your bet the first time and believing that bet the second time, but how do you even know that it's the same it's second time? It's not a problem. So when you take a leap of faith and fall on the ground 1,000 meters below, there is no second time. <laughs> and, and, and so uh, that, that, that's the reason, in fact, if we want to do anything like TOFU, we have to have a very strong deployment model and a very thorough analysis of what's going on. And I've been thinking about this a lot, and I have no wonderful things to say. I'm thinking it's general, it's initial establishment of trust. Yeah. And, and an introduction, and we haven't got the pixie dust yet. Yes. Oh, excuse and, me. And, 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 and that, we have no magic there yet. And that may be something we want to look at precisely, this, this poem of uh, how, how do I do a progressive building up of uh, trust with the server, I mean, the server tells me something about who they are, I believe it's plausible, et cetera. Because, and, and, and that's, that's a very interesting problem, actually. That's the problem we do encounter. I mean, I, I, I am sensitive to the enterprise deployment issue, but take my laptop there. If I am at Microsoft, it's going to be deployed in the enterprise. But if I'm here and I plug the Ethernet jack into some kind of uh, terminal room, from the laptop point of view, it doesn't know where, where it is until it does something. So that's, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so, so, just, just, study there. so just to clarify, uh, we, we want to keep TOFU out of scope for now. This, this is something that hopefully we'll get back to, but we would like to proceed ahead with the solution that, uh, that we have now as a, a kind of framework that we can build uh, upon. Okay, so, and uh, the last uh, topic that we discussed, the threat analysis and uh, use cases uh, need to be extended a little bit. It's uh, uh, rather Im immature at this stage. So the decision was to rescope it slightly and then continue uh, working on it. Uh, and then when it's more mature, uh, start the adoption. Okay, so just to wrap this up, uh, the algorithm on a very high level is to, if you can, do authentication and encryption. And if you can't, just do the uh, encryption. We will match those two drafts. 
uh, tofu is out of scope for now and the companion draft uh, that describes the threat analysis and use cases will uh, continue. Okay, Francis? Uh, Francis Dupont from IEC. Uh, when I talk with cryptographers, uh, something they insist about. So it's a very bad idea to do encryption only without authentication. Encryption should be always authenticated. Okay, that's wanted to take this one. So, so the IOC published an RFC recently um, explicitly disagreeing with you. <laughs> um, yes, agree it is not a good idea, but an even worse idea is no authentication and no encryption. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so that's it regarding the introduction. So Lishan will tell you the details. What does it mean if you can? Uh, this is the security safety v6 and the list contains all the people And this list contains all the persons involved in the work. Uh, first, for the motivation, currently we have two security CPV6 jobs. One is the security CPV6, which achieves the dear CPV6 authentication. Another is the dear CPV6 encryption. Dear CP encryption can protect dear CPV6 from passive attack such as the privacy monitoring attack. And the IETF has expressed that PM attack should be mitigated where possible. And if we have write two drafts separately, vendors may implement authentication but ignore encryption. So this document merges the two drafts and achieves the DRCP v6 authentication and the encryption. Uh, to achieve the wide use of secure DRCP v6, we propose the opportunistic security for DRCP v6, which can provide privacy protection as much as possible. And the encryption is available even when the authentication is not available. So the default OS policy is if the authentication is available, then the communication is authenticated and encrypted. If the authentication is not available, but the public key has been exchanged, then the communication is not authenticated but encrypted. For some scenarios such as enterprise network, where the security policy is very strict, we can cite the local explicit security policy the communication must be authenticated and encrypted. Then the local explicit security policy will supersede the default OS policy and the following year CPV6 configuration process must be authenticated and encrypted. This finger shows the overview of the secure year CPV6. And uh, before the encrypted DRCP v6 configuration, we add the server authentication or public key communication process. Uh, first, the client multicast the information request message to the DRCP v6 server. Uh, it should be noted that the information request message must not uh, contain any uh, prior privacy information about the client, such as the UID and the certificate. When receiving the information request message, the server sends a reply message to client with the certificate option, time step option, signature option, and the server identifier option. And when the client is pre-configured the trusted CA certificates or the trusted server's certificate, it has the ability to ver verify the identity of the server. 
then it uh, verifies it, and uh, in addition, it uh, obtains the server's public key. Uh, if the client has no capability to verify server's identity, it uh, just uh, obtains the server's public key. After the client uh, obtains the server's public key, the client will encrypt message from client to server with the server's public key. And it should be noted that the solicit message contains the client's certificate for the client authentication or public key communication. And this finger shows the format of the encrypted message. The standard DHCP message is encrypted with the recipient's public key, and then the encrypted message is formed the encrypted message is encapsulated into the encrypted message option, and then the encrypted query or response message is formed. And this is the new defined options and the message. There are five new DHCPv6 options and two new DHCPv6 messages. And the first of four options has defined in the secure DHCPv6, and the last three has defined in DHCPv6 encryption uh, draft. And in, uh, besides this draft, we will also have companion document secure DHCPv6 deployment. This draft will analyze the threat model and the deployed, uh, deployment consideration. And uh, any comments? The minutes can reflect that. Two thumbs up from Randy. <laughs> <laughs> and from Ted. Yeah, no, this, I, I think this, this is a good way forward and uh, will offer us what's been lacking for a long time. Martin Shalesky, I see. I just want to point out what we've been talking about at some point that the rebind case should also be probably covered here, right? Like, well, if I, <clears throat> the rebind case, like yeah, the server has a binding. The, the encrypted messages, and that's something we have to look at is how to do it. It needs to, if it reaches a different server, the certificate may be different and the negotiation will have to sort of start from the <laughs> beginning. So, right. I don't and have any good solution for that in mind yet, but just, Something it, that should be covered. So Bernie Volts here. It might be something that, you know, we have to look at in like a failover protocol or some out of band. The service could do something, communicate something out of band. Uh, yeah, it's actually one thing that could happen is the server could, well, if, if both of the servers on the wire use the same, the same certificate, then you don't have a problem. You can, you can send the rebind as an encrypted message and it will be decryptable by both servers. And there's no reason not to do that. That's one solution. Another solution is to do an information request before you do a rebind, just as if you were gonna do a solicit. Um, so there's lots of ways to solve this, and I guess we'll need to think about right. that. We, that's, that's the only point, is we have to come up with a solution to try to figure yeah. out how to deal with a rebind. Yeah, yeah, it's a good, really good point. And, and you know, the, the same could be applied to a confirm, although maybe you, know, maybe you just say you don't do that, you just do the rebind in, or, or renew or something. I mean, that's something we'll have to think about. Because, right. you know, the confirm is, is usually sent to all the servers. So part of our to-do list is examine all of the possible messages that the client could send after it's connected to the server and make sure that we've actually accounted for the ways that can go wrong. Right, or or say that you cannot use those. Like the confirm, I mean, loss of the confirm might not be that, you know, problematic, right? Yeah, or you just send a confirm as, a, as an encrypted message to the, to the server you were speaking to before, and if it doesn't get through, well, then you start over. I'm Jim Metat here. Um, yeah, that point reminded me of uh, another thing. I think uh, this actually applies to the solicit case also because solicit message was also encrypted and basically assumed to be received by multiple servers. But we, we, they, uh, the, this, it's the same discussion that should be able to apply. So this doesn't change anything, but uh, I guess uh, we should also think about the solicit case. Yeah, Ted Lemon again. Yeah, I mean, in the case of solicit, sorry, in the case of solicit, you, uh, 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 
Yeah, we, we, the, the, the normal selection mechanism, uh, if you do an information request, you need, to, you need probably to do a solicit individually to each server that responds to the information request. Mm -hmm. right. so, so it's a little chatty, but you know. So we'll have to look at all that, but it's all solvable. Uh, Brian Haberman, this is really just something to think about. So I would assume that there's going to be some relationship between certain kinds of messages. The one that comes to mind is if I get an address over the secure channel, do I expect a release message to come over the secure channel? And if that's the case, what happens to the poor guys here that want to do the DHCP release from the relays? <laughs> Randy Bush, that's well, it, that there is a clear um, credential issue at that point. And um, I will admit to just starting to read. But um, if the relay is releasing because the client has gone to Florida. Well, I think that Randy, Bernie, this is just to interrupt. I mean, the relay is not even going to know what what the what it can release because it can't look inside the encrypted message to, in the first place to glean the address that was assigned to the client. Okay, yep. and that's a whole another issue that we probably have to discuss because there are you know there are issues for some other deployments like. Uh, Doxis with CMTSs that are today gleaming, you know, they're 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 monitoring the DHCP traffic and extracting information from it. Okay, and so that's a whole nother problem that we will probably have to face at some point. Is how do you do that that out of band communication? Yeah, or, there's or a big in band. There. Sorry, in band communication <laughs> to provide that, or do you do it out of band? You know, there could be something. As well. If the client has not given the relay sufficient credential to revoke and the client's gone to Mexico, you're not going anywhere. Right, but the thing is that normally what happens is right, the, I the client sends a message happens. which will be encrypted. The relay snooped, I got the, it. Well, no, what happened is, is right, the client sends an encrypted message, the relay is gonna wrap that into a relay forward message, into a relay message, okay? and send it off to the server. When the message comes back, the server can include other information that is in the clear or encrypted with the relay agent's key that's only for the relay. And the client message will go back. So that's what we, we had a, you know, Ralph may remember this, we had an early proposal to do this where we wanted to avoid the client to have to snoop, uh, sorry, the relay to have to snoop that information. And we had a way of sending that to the relay in the, the the message that went between the server and the relay, and that might be something that, that we have to go back credible. and look at. Was that? That feels credible. Okay, right. There's no this that that's the way to avoid layer violations or security violations, right? Because we're not peeking into somebody else's message yeah. <laughs> or have to have that security association to decrypt. Christian's that. very worried that we're running out of V6 address space leases. So, I mean, one one question that we really probably ought to answer is how strongly do we feel about the cable modem case? Because uh, I think that the point that you've raised here is exactly right. It does open a pretty big can of worms, um, which may be worth opening. But but um, we should we should we should decide that we want to open it and not just sort of wander into it. Right. Yeah. I mean, it is a bit more controlled environment, you know, because they have the DOCSIS standards and stuff like that. So in their model, they may just say, we're not going to use this. this right, yeah, I mean, that, that's right. always their option. They can always just say, huh, that's not going to work. Right. Yeah, I, I didn't mean to derail the conversation. I just wanted to make sure that the working group was, was going to think through all of these message relationships yeah. and the implications of having these intermediate devices. And, and, and that means that doing that as a relay function, that's overloading the idea of the relay by seeing the relay release release, is maybe not the right way to see that. The right way to see that is that you have uh, the, the, the router on which the client was connected knows that that particular subscriber with a subscriber ID or whatever is disconnected. 
And there's a management channel to tell the DHCP server, hey, that guy is gone, release the resource you have for him. Which is but more in line with each, each player staying within their roles. Uh, so this question, so this is not just like a cable modem thing, like uh, I'm pretty sure the DSL deployments will break as well. So like the, uh, the, the TR101 talks oh, yeah. about some kind of uh, anti-spoofing function, right? So the anti-spoofing function on the DSLAM actually looks at the DHCP going through to associate the address with some port that it's sitting on. So we somehow had to figure that out as well. So it's not, so let's call it all networks situation. Right, I, I wasn't trying to say it was only an issue with DOCSIS, I was just giving that as an example. Uh, John Brzezowski, Bernie, uh, question and some comments. So I, I think when you described, you know, having like separate aspects of the really forward and having the ability for the CMTS to kind of gain access to a portion to do things like prefix delegation route injection would probably work. I think we have to think through it. The, the other, some of the comments that I would make is, you know, I, I would struggle to find a reason why I would want or need to turn this on. I don't think it's, I don't think it's a bad idea, right? I just, yeah. I'm, I'm sitting here thinking to myself, okay, I, I've got lots of other things going on, you know, that are, are higher priority. This sounds interesting. I, I'm sure there's other kind of justifiable reasons why, but I, I'm not sure I would, right? I mean, the, the, you know, the use case is more these things and stuff like that. Yeah, my, right? my cable network, you know, we have, we have security mechanisms built into Doxus. Correct. Um, the only other thing that I would suggest is like, you know, when we talked about them, like, you know, when we, when we trigger, um, Rapid commit, you know how like you know, that's kind of an exchange there. It'd be interesting at some point if, and, and this might kind of just negate the entire thing. I haven't thought through this comment entirely, but it'd be interesting if there's a, if, if there's a way that you could kind of negotiate the ability to do this. Um, and I haven't read the draft, so you can you can tell me to sit down and shut up. But um, uh, it's just comes to something that comes to the top of mind, right? Right. Well, I mean, it is negotiated because it'll, and and this has to be worked out in the draft is that you know the client instead of sending a solicit as the first step sends an information request yep. and if it gets you know some server out there that's willing to offer it these capabilities it probably would prefer those right to use yeah. those and you know we still have to figure out exactly you know, how many times you retry if you don't get anything or you get stuff that says no i don't do security you know that kind of thing so, i'm sorry Randy Bush, is that downgrade by statistical probability? I I don't know. I mean that that's something that we still have to determine exactly what that is because there's going to be networks oh, yeah. that you want to connect to. Well, maybe not you, but that some people want to connect to that will not offer this at least originally, right? I mean, you know, you walk into a coffee shop unless oh, we. But but we're staying out of that for the moment. Yeah, I. I'm just, <laughs> And, and one thing that I'll get out of the way for Ted, I mean, I think that item that we just talked about the negotiation, I think that would also allow for like an incremental kind of enablement approach, right? I mean, right. Could, yeah, a bulk, bulk turn this on. I mean, I think we've all learned that lesson very interestingly for V6, that doesn't, that's not gonna fly. So for, I think that's For you, John, that the, the servers, the credential I need to the server is gonna be burned into your modem. Yeah. So, uh, Randy, sorry, that was it. You, you wanna talk first? Cause I no, that was it. To Mike first. That was it. You're, you're I'm through. Okay, uh, Ted Lemon again. So yeah, I mean, one of the things that that obviously I'm, I I don't know I I Dishan, I don't I don't remember if if your document already talks about this, but um, if you send out the information request and all of the replies that you get back do not include keys, you have a decision to make. Oh. Do you? You you mean uh, I received the reply message without the key? Right. So, in other words, there are no servers that support opportunistic security on the link, right? Yeah. Then, in that case, you just have to decide, you know, do I send my DHCP message in the clear, or do I just stay silent? Well, but but it depends on the on the that the that depends on the client policy. If you want to be super right, exactly. super secure and yeah, and exactly. you just not connect. That's exactly the point I had in mind was uh, I was mentioning identifying what you're connected to. Because take the example of my laptop, in the ideal world, if I plug my laptop in my office, it should be securely connected to the Microsoft server so that nobody plays a game with me. If I connect it 
in some kind of coffee shop somewhere, I'm going to say, oh, well, I'm going to take what I'm going to take. But what I don't want to do is be at the Microsoft office and have some joker send me a fake packet so that I believe I'm at a coffee shop. So I can speak to that a little bit if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so the, the, uh, the answer there is in, in, in the exact scenario you described, you, have a, you already have a security association with Microsoft, and so you're always going to take the Microsoft server, regardless of who else advertises a key, right? We, that, that's, that's the reason we really need to do the threat analysis completely and can, see can what are the channels the and all that. Yeah, yeah I mean, there, there's a whole lot of fun stuff there. Like, for example, what if you're on a... What if you're at the coffee shop and they don't support opportunistic security, but somebody advertises opportunistic security? Do you choose them instead? So yeah, it's it's absolutely we have to do that. And that's that's what the next draft is. Yes. Going to talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, the next draft is about the security of CPV6 deployment, and uh, uh, I. The security of CPUv6 has provided authentication and the encryption mechanism for DR CPUv6. And this document analyzes the DR CPUv6 threat model and provides a guideline for the security of CPUv6 deployment. And first, the DR CPUv6 threat model for the DR CPUv6 client. It is faced with the injection attacks, spoofing attacks, and the rogue servers. Because of the above attack, client may be configured with the incorrect, uh, incorrect information, such as unavailable address. For the DRCPV6 message contact, it is faced with the privacy monitoring attack and the mine in the middle attack. Attacker may glean the privacy information to find the location information and so on. For DHCPv6 server, it is faced with the DOS attack. The maintenance of and the management of the large keyboards in DHCPv6 server may be the problem. Uh, for the secure DHCPv6 deployment, uh, we consider two different scenarios. One scenario is enterprise network. Uh, where clients are stable terminals and uh, the secure security requirement is strict. Uh, the communication must be authenticated and encrypted. For the deployment, we can cite the local strict security policy. And for the server authentication, client is pre-configured the trusted server certificates or the trust CA certificates, it has the ability to verify the server's identity. For the client authentication, client is pre-configured the ACE certificate, and this can be used for the client authentication. For the DHCPv6 encryption, DHCPv6 message is encrypted with the public key contained in the cert. And another scenario is public coffee shop clients are uh, mobile terminals. Uh, so in this scenario, the server authentication and the client authentication is optional. Client A, because client A not pre-configured the trust server certificate, it has no ability to verify the server's identity, but maybe it can obtain the server's public key. And uh, for the server authentication, the client may not pre-configured its certific certificates, so it can just send its public key to server. For the DHCP encryption, if the public key has exchanged, then the communication will be non-authenticated but encrypted. And uh, that's the consideration. Two scenarios. I think we covered a lot of the discussion related to this yeah. earlier. Um, so, okay. So we had a 
good discussion about many different aspects here. So there are three questions that uh, uh, I would like to ask the working group. So, <coughs> excuse me. So the first one is uh, the decision whether we want to drop the authentication only mode and try to go with the approach that we do uh, encryption every time and authentication if possible. So uh, let's do the humming now. So who thinks that uh, it's a it's a right direction? Please hum now. Okay. Who thinks that this is a bad idea? Please hum now. Okay. So just for the record, there was much louder uh, hum in favor. Okay, so the next question. Uh, the question is, if you think that it's okay to uh, drop tofu to be out of scope for now, if you think that's okay, please come now. Okay, and if you think that it's a bad idea, please come now. Tomek, just a, a comment on the previous hum. Somebody hummed that it was a bad idea uh, traditionally, the right thing to do when that happens is ask them why they hummed, <laughs> because otherwise they might have something to tell us that we need to know that we didn't mm -hmm. hear. I was going to wait for the end of the slide. <laughs> well, and I also think if if there are people that you know, I, I think a lot of it's hard to do right now because we don't have the text and stuff. But if there are people that have issues and stuff like that, you know, if you don't want to come up here, send them to the mailing list by all means, if you have concerns about this work. Mm -hmm. Okay, <clears throat> just for the record, we... Uh, okay, and uh, the last question is whether we should continue refining the secure DHCPv6 deployment uh, draft and uh, then do the adoption call once it's uh, more mat mature. If you think that's the right direction, please come. Okay, if you think that it's complete garbage and we should drop it, please come now. Okay, cool. So just for the record, uh, the consensus in the room is that, uh, well, lots of people are supporting this and there was nobody uh, uh, in favor of dropping this. Okay, so let's go with the next topic. This is about uh, the HCPv6 uh, failover update. Uh, so this is the work that Kim Kinnear is doing. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here with us, so Bernie will do I'm the presentation. The, yeah, I'm the virtual Kim. So um, just a quick uh, look back at sort of the original plan, which was uh, that, you know, we had a redundancy considerations draft that was written um, and it was published. There was a requirements document about what failover v6 would look like. Um, and that was published. And then a design document was written and um, was, you know, presented to the working group, adopted and passed. However, during AD review, it was sent back to the working group. Um, and the, the um, you know, assuming it had gone forward, the last step in the process would have been to do uh, protocol document or documents, the idea being that, you know, there could be multiple implementations of the concepts embodied in a failover, in, in failover. So it didn't have to be necessarily one protocol document because often, you know, it only exchanges sort of active lease information and not configuration information and so forth, but still different servers have different uh, capabilities and requirements. So the AD feedback, uh, was that they felt that, you know, it was not really implementable, the design document was not implementable on its own, that um, design decisions discussed, you know, aren't really standards track material, and what if the protocol draft required something that the design document either didn't accommodate or, or might have disallowed, right? So uh, basically it was thought that it was not ready for the ISG, and uh, Ted, Kim, and Tomek discussed, and they decided to split the failover design and move forward to produce uh, a failover protocol uh, draft. And uh, 
you know, it's taken a little bit to do that, um, but that's what uh, Kim did. So uh, the, the design document that had been written becomes two drafts. One is a failover design, which covers some of the, the material that's over there, and a uh, new failover protocol document that covers the stuff on the other side which deals more with you know, exactly how the messages flow, what the message formats are, what the options are, and things like that. Um, so the reality turned out to be that it was a little bit hard to sort of separate that material into exactly the, that original design concept. But Kim developed a protocol document which contains the how of the protocol, uh, he moved minimal necessary Y from the design draft into the protocol draft. Now, he, that added about nine pages to the draft. He's, he's hypersensitive about the size of the draft because, you know, it is, it is at least, it, you know, a lot of these, like the V4 failover draft was over like 130 pages and stuff. And so, you know, we've tried to, size has been an issue. And that was one of the reasons for the original grand design is that it would have been easier to review it incrementally rather than as one big document. Um, it doesn't really have an overview. There's not much substantial text left in the design draft. Um, and, you know, he really has little energy for a chatty, more informational design draft. So he's proposing to deprioritize the design draft and just move forward on the protocol draft. Okay, it's not to say if somebody wants to pick up that work and eventually do it, fine, or if somebody wants to help him, you know, he's willing to, to work with somebody to do it. So the protocol draft ended up in these numbers. There are the uh, page counts, because I said <laughs> he's very sensitive to how, how large everything is. Um, the intro, the IANA stuff, uh, you know, the ACK references, basically some of the boilerplate stuff that's required ended up being 11 pages. Concepts and facilities, uh, which mainly came from the design document, uh, were seven, and then, you know, the others are there, which is most of the, the important stuff. Um, the security section is a bit small right now, but that's mainly because a lot of the security issues were handled in the uh, active lease query work that was recently going on, and this uses the same message framing and things like that as that, similar connection, man pretty much identical connection management and stuff like that. So. The idea is that we can hopefully point to that document rather than having to repeat the security considerations. Um, so here's a breakdown uh, pie chart of, of what it looks like, uh, which is kind of interesting. But anyway, <laughs> well, Kim, you know, Kim was very concerned about the page count. So uh, he's, he's sorry he's, for interrupting. Just uh, information. Uh, why he was so concerned? Because the last failover attempt in 2003 it failed because the whole document was over 130 pages <laughs> and nobody could review it. So that's why it's good to yeah. keep it small. So, so some definition um, of small. The issues and questions he has, is everybody okay with the deprioritizing the design draft and focusing on the protocol draft? Comments, pro, con? Ted says, let the record show, Ted shows two, two thumbs up. Um, he is looking for a better name for the concepts and facilities section. Um, and again, if you go read the draft and, and you have suggestions for how, what that might be titled, send a, a note to, to him or the mailing list. Um, there are some questions right now in, in the current draft. There, there is some stuff about you know communicating what needs to be you know, what was added to DNS and therefore may need to be removed and stuff. And that right now uses um, its own sub option space, which we kind of want to get rid of and probably should should just be top level options encapsulated in there. Um, you know, he's asking what's missing. So if you do look at it and you go, oh, you know, because again, the, the design document might never see the light of day. So anything that was in there that was important um, might have to be moved. Um, there's a question about, you know, and that, that goes back to the previous thing that I mentioned about the DNS removal options. Does DNS or DNS update stuff really belong in this thing? It is right now six pages. And so he's, you know, again, page county is concerned about it. 
Um, he also wants to make sure the protocol, why well, the protocol does hang together. Um, and, uh, you know, those are some of the issues that, that he has. So, he's looking for, you know, he feels the document right now is about 90% complete. And there, there's still some edits he needs to do and some stuff, but he does think it's 90% complete. He's looking for two to four reviewers. So, anybody willing to step up to review the document? Okay, Ted says January. Anybody else? Marcin, okay, excellent. And I'm, I'm also doing a uh, review of it and probably about 60% of the way there and I, I do have quite a few comments for him. Um, and I, I don't know, you know, I was sending, gonna hand him a paper but I think I do all something to the list so we, I have to figure out exactly what I'll send to the list. But um, most of the, the, at least of what I found, it, I've not found any real mistakes or anything like that, just mainly tightening up the text and, and doing some some uh, minor edits and stuff like that. And uh, he's hoping to get those comments fairly quickly from the reviewers and then republish uh, based on that, those comments. Jinmei. Uh, Jinmei Tat, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm willing to <laughs> take a look at it, but 80 pages <laughs> seem awful to me. So. Maybe uh, it's helpful if the authors um, can specify some specific uh, subset of the draft uh, that can be uh, reviewed separately. Then probably, uh, at least I could do that. Well, and I think, I think you can do some of that yourself because for example, you might, you know, most of the, I mean, a lot of the pages, and I, I again, we can go back to the pie graph and look, but you know, a lot of the pages have to do with all of the individual option definitions and things like that, you know, the, the normal diagrams and stuff like that. So, you know, you, you might, your first pass might be to skip that detail because, you know, you don't really care how the stuff goes on the wire. You know, you know that this data is going to go, but you don't care what format it's in and stuff like that. And so just, just review it without skipping that material and you'll probably cut out 20, 30 pages. Okay. Um, it's pretty, it, it flows pretty nicely, the document. So. Okay. Um, you know, just, just dig in and start reviewing it because it does flow very well. All right. Um, he's, he's done this quite a few times now and he's gotten very good at writing the failover. I'll give it a try. <laughs> okay, thank okay. you. Uh, Tomek here. So I got just uh, one more volunteer on Jabber. Sean Routier uh, said that he will review it, so we have one more. Great, it's in the Jabber document or in the uh, Etherpad document. Uh, this is the DRCPv6 prefix length hint issue. And uh, the RC3633 allows the client to send a prefix length hint to the server to indicate its pref preference for the prefix length, but it is unclear about the server and the client behavior. So this document summarizes the unclear edges cases and provides guideline on client or server behavior. It should be noted that it is an optional guideline, no mandate requirement. Uh, for the solid state problem, when client requires a prefix length different from its previous prefix, for the client, how should the client indic indicate whether it wants a different prefix or the previous prefix? For the server, whether to honor the request prefix length hint or retain the previous prefix. And this slide shows our proposed solution for, for the client. If it prefers specific length, the prefix length field is the preferred prefix length value and the IPv6 prefix field is zero. If it uh, prefer previous uh, prefix, uh, then the length field is the length of the fix uh, prefix and the IPv6 prefix field is the previous uh, prefix value. For the server behavior, uh, the server should try to honor the hint of the preferred prefix. 
for the uh, advertised message, if none of the received ma prefix match the prefix length hint, and the client uh, should have two behavior. One is it can could use the received prefix. It should choose one closest to the prefix length hint. If it could not use it, it will ignore the advertised message and continue to send the solicited message at defined intervals to avoid traffic congestion. For the renew uh, message client, if client prefer prefix length different from the current used prefix, uh, the client should include two IAPD prefix option in the same IAPD option, one containing the current prefix, another containing the prefix length hint. Uh, the server could do one of the following depending on the server policy, renew the orig original prefix, uh, renew the original Num number one and another is renew the original prefix and assign a new prefix of the length. Uh, the three is give the original prefix zero lifetime and assign a new prefix. The four is giving the original prefix zero preferred lifetime and a short non zero valid valid time and assign a new prefix. And the next step is whether we have considered all the uh, NPCs and whether the proposed solution are feasible. And Martin may be saying the same thing that I am, which is I there's a number I five no from the previous slide. Uh, I would say the fifth option, which is probably, I would think the correct option is uh, if the server, the server can, um, assign a new prefix and not mention the previous prefix, meaning that the previous prefix would just die after it, after its lifetime expires, but would continue until then. So in other words, there's no reason to force the, the flash renumbering. I uh, think the force is more uh, feasible and the three is not feasible. I, I think three and four are uh, not a great idea. Um, oh. It would be better to just, to just, uh, uh, assign a new prefix. In fact, so uh, what I would suggest is neither one, two, three, or four. Mm -hmm. I would suggest uh, five, which is um, assign a new prefix and don't list the other prefix. In, in which case, if, if the DHCP server gives a new prefix but doesn't say anything about the old prefix, the old prefix is still valid until its lifetime expires. So then, you know, that way you you don't have to worry about a sudden renumbering on the on the uh, on the seat, well on the on the on the client. Yeah, I think uh, there's burning goals. I think I think that's a you know it's definitely we, we should definitely include it in the list of options. And then there's probably the, the the whole thing about you know discussing which ones and what the consequences are. I mean, one of the other things, and and sorry, Marston. But one of the other things that uh, Oli Tron mentioned to me is that right now this is standards track uh, document. And I don't think it really should be. I think it's probably more an informational BCP type of document because I don't think it, that it, it it's a it's sort of a recommendation as to how you do things. It's not a protocol. You know, it's not you must do this or must not do this type of document. Martin Shalesky. So. Um, I wanted to relate to the case where the client wants a new prefix and it keeps the old prefix it has and when it gets a new one it sort of drops the other one and I think we had the discussion during the, uh, the the biz meeting this week that in such case we basically wanted the client to release the address of prefix before it gets a new one because well for instance systemic thought that, you know, the, the server may be constrained in a sense that it just allows one prefix per client, right? So if you're requesting two prefixes, the server may just reject that request and say, no, you have a prefix, so I cannot allocate a new one for you, right? So from that perspective, it would be safer for the client to just, or requesting router actually to release the prefix and try to require something else, 
Uh, so you mean we should first release the? I mean, oh, I don't well, know. It, that might be a matter of the, the further. I don't think you because the problem is you don't know whether you're going to get a new prefix, so you don't want to release the old one until right. right. So that. So and I perhaps think we need to amend. We, we um, need to amend some conclusions from the discussion we have we had during the biz meeting. But that was a different the, case. That's where a client it? wanted to change an address, not necessarily. You know, it's a little different. Okay. Case. I, I think this that's why you know some discussion about what the what the you know both the servers and client consequences are for e each of these four or five whatever number of cases are is appropriate right to describe why so one is you know we're saying the server could do these things but why well, should it to? or should it not do one over the other type of thing John Rozowski, so we're writing them to, so that means at any re renew message, there'll be two active prefixes in a customer premise network. That, it, depending on which option you choose, right? If you, if you as an operator don't want to do that, then you might pick, you might say to the server, use option three, right? Because then you would say, get rid of your old prefix and immediately starting, start using that one. If you want to be more graceful to the customer, you might say, you might want option four, which says, okay, I'm going to let that customer, you know, I want new traffic to go out with a new, uh, under the new prefix, but I'm going to pass a short lifetime to let them finish up right. anything that they're doing, right? Yep. I mean, yep. that, that often, you know, that also presumes that the rest of the infrastructure, CPE, whatever, supports that, right? Yep. Yeah, and there, I mean, there's some operational impacts to two and four, for example, right? Because you'll, you'll effectively increase the number of uh, delegated prefixes you have in your access network, right? Which, are, which you know, yeah, it's, you know, it should be supportable within reason, right? But it, it also is something that cannot be underestimated, right? Right. I think, you know, in general, I think my comment about this entire, you know, work, and I was going to send some comments on the, on the mailing list as well, is, you know, you and I have had some conversations kind of out of, outside of, this room, uh, I think it's just it's. Um, if we're going to clarify some stuff here, I think we should make sure that it's crystal clear that you know when when a when a device attempts to renew a delegated prefix, that we should do our best to ensure that that the prefix that is in fact renewed is as close to its original prefix length length as as possible, right? Um, I think items like that are are pretty important as far as clarifying RFC 3633 is concerned. So it's yes. I think I think it's important to clarify. I'll I'll, I'll read through the draft some more, and I'll yeah. I'll send some stuff on the list. Yeah, and I I, I think that's the bottom line is you know people were, you know, the, this is being presented here to raise awareness of it and to get people to look at it and review it. Um, you know, it's still an individual submission at this time, um, but it is it is important work. Okay, um, just one minor comment, Martin Shulowski. I think the way your presentation is structured is better than the way that the draft is structured because the oh, presentation yeah. is like a problem statement, solution, problem statement, solution, whereas the draft is like set of problem statements and by the time I get to the solutions, I forget what the problem was, right? Yes, yes, the draft structure needs to be modified. It is not clear currently. And sorry, one, one more point. I, I made a point on the mailing list that there was some issue that if you wanted two prefixes or you wanted to transition from one prefix to another, you use the same IAPD option yes. to request and to renew, which I thought was a good idea because, which I thought was not a good idea because you should actually generate the new IAPD with the new IAID to, to get the new prefix. I mean, this is what the state police recommends, right? So if I read your presentation correctly, you actually move to this idea proposed on the mailing list that you generate the new IAPD for the new prefix? Uh, no, you don't want to no. do that because then you could end up, you would end up potentially with two prefixes where the, the intent of the client is to just get what it wanted, which is the, the well, prefix I, of the right I thought that was, that was the idea in the draft that you don't want to get rid of the old prefix until you know that you get another prefix. Right, and that's what this fine. behavior here is all about, right? Is to say when you renew, or rebind that you ask you say I have this prefix I'd like to renew it and I have I also would like a prefix you know it's really saying instead of saying so you have to give a hint you, yes the you give a hint in this case to say 
I want a prefix of. Where do you put the hint? In the separate IAPD? Or yeah, and in, in a separate IA, so, sorry, in a separate IA adder, IA prefix option, right? An IAPD would have two IA prefix options, one with your original, the, your lease that you want to renew, and the other is an, well, a hint but, IA prefix. Well, I'm not sure how that plays with the safe solutions, actually. We need to, uh, That's, maybe we should There's have no a, prohibition against that, so, okay. Oh, well, we should talk about it offline, I guess. All right. <laughs> All right, well, we have a few more minutes. I'll run through this one. This is an update on where uh, things stand with the DHPV6 biz work. Um, this is pretty much the same thing as last time. We're working on it. We're reducing tickets, but we're also getting a few new ones occasionally. So, you know, it's it's going slowly, but we're making progress. Um, I won't run through this list, but here's uh, the, all the current tickets. There's you know about 20 of them that are open. Um, one that we discussed briefly at Prague, in Prague, was this issue about the option, request option, and what should be in there. And uh, we had a, a discussion within the biz team about this, and this is what we are proposing, and we would like to see if anybody has feedback, either here or on the mailing list, um, and that is that in the ORO, protocol required options must not appear, okay? And those are things like client ID, server ID, things like that, okay? And what we'll actually do is the biz document will provide a list of the options, and we will also ask IANA to add a column to the option registry to flag it as such, to say this is a, a um, you know, protocol required option or something. I don't know. We'll have to figure out what, the, what to call it, but basically saying don't put this in the ORO under any case, under any circumstance. Other top level options must appear in the ORO or they will not be sent by the server, okay? The exception, obviously, is that a server may be administratively configured to send options, okay? So we're allowing that out, but the idea is that, you know, you, the server's only going to send what comes, what, what a client requested in the ORO. Only container options must appear in the ORO. So, and, and the idea here is this, this is a, to address, like, the software PDB, myth PDB case and stuff like that is that only the top level containing option, the, the option that contains the others, will be requested, not the individual options um, that uh, might be inside a container option. Um, and the server will send the full bundle of whatever is in that container um, to the client. Um, and so there's a prohibition against you know, must not, the options that are only encapsulated options must not appear, all right? Now, there's an exception for that case because we need to have that exception, um, but the exception comes with a consequence that it requires server processing. So, you know, we have an option like the prefix exclude option, which is actually encapsulated, and this is one that a client has to negotiate that says I'm willing or able to do this, Okay, and therefore it's allowed to be in the ORO. And again, so there are, there are, there is the ability for encapsulated options to be in the ORO, but they do require special processing by the server, and so that's just something to, to note. So, any comments about this proposal? And again, you know, you don't have to think, you may want to think about it more and comment on the mailing list, because I will send something out to the mailing list after. Uh, you know, early next week, probably, uh, on all these issues. All right. Okay, so I have one question from Jabber. Uh, Sean is asking, uh, so if we continue with this approach, what should the server do when the client requests an uh, encapsulated option in Oro? Sh should the server drop the whole packet? And probably not, so that's why he suggests that it's and not must not, but should not. Uh, no, it's must not, but this, that doesn't mean that the server is going to drop the packet if it appears. 
And, and that's something that I think that we should, we got to make very clear uh, if it's not already in 3350, I mean, as you know, neither a client or server should drop a packet just because they don't recognize an option. Okay. I mean, they can skip it and that's what they're supposed to do. And so in an ORO, if a server is asked for an encapsulating option, it probably won't, they'll say, oh, I don't have this in my configuration. Yeah, it would, it would, it would be a lot of extra. In the containers. So it'd yeah, be a lot of extra work to check. I'm sorry? There will be a lot of extra work to check. Yeah, right. Yeah. All right, a uh, new ticket, and this one is a tough one um, because basically there's the question, and, and obviously 3315 didn't really address it, is, you know, suppose a client has done, you know, has done solicit, all that stuff, and gotten some option, option foo. And then it does a renewal, for example, and it requests option foo, but the server doesn't send option foo anymore. Okay, probably because the server's configuration has changed not to send that option. Okay, so we are trying, what we're trying to say here is in general, okay, because it's, it's a little tricky in some cases, the client is, is really, should remove any previous configuration that it had gotten from the server for that particular option, okay? Um, again, there are some complicated cases and we probably should request that, you know, they do a, a RADA or, or when we do a, a 72.27, you know, the option guidelines, do a biz to say, you know, you should document the behavior if it has to be something else. Because for example, for the, for the DHCP4 or 6 DHCP server, if that gets removed, what, what consequence does that have? You know, does that mean that the, the client should tear down the v4 connection that it might have gotten for that or not and so you know it's a in general type of statement um for for clients comments on this one much so uh quick question so it sounds like we need we would need to update the option guidelines to actually tell that you know if you're coming up with a new option you should tell Right, what to do if the option is not there anymore, right? So does that warrant the new draft for updating the option guidelines then? <coughs> well, I think I, I'm a little bit think, figured out, but maybe we file an errata against it, or I, I don't know what the right way to do it is for now, you know, so we track it. And we may, or maybe we put some text in 3315 biz that, that says options should document uh, any special behavior in this situation. Right, but then you come up with two documents that talk mostly about the same. Yeah, I, I don't know. We'll have to figure it out, right? Uh, Ian Farrah, yeah, um, yeah, I mean, I'm certainly seeing clients that have um, unpredictable behavior when these, these kind of things happen. Um, so it would be good to have some text that describes how it should work. Um, the example that you've got down there, I think, is, is very good um, because we have got a case. We've got two different protocols with different timers associated with them, and you know we're adding in something here that something could be, uh, that could revoke the functionality before the lease has been revoked. There's all kinds of synchronization issues, and I'm not sure, without more thought, as to exactly what the right behaviour should be. Um, but in general, yes, I think it's, it's yeah, good to that, have that in there. You know, that case is probably a a weird case anyway because it's either a, a very bad misconfiguration, right? Or if you decided you want to get rid of the service, you know, there, there's other implications for what do you do with clients that are currently using it, right? You've got to be careful about that. So, uh, Ted Lemon, actually, Ian, um, it sounds like you have data. <laughs> it might be interesting if you were to share that data, if you're willing. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, another issue that recently was raised by Tim Winters was um, there's currently no text for if a client you know, sh should invalidate prefix information that has been delegated when a DHCPv6 release for the IAPD is performed. And this is, you know, so you've got a, a CPE box that is, or a home router or something that is releasing its delegated prefix. What, you know, we, we say, okay, it's got to release it. And in, in the address case, 3315 says, hey, the client better stop using that address. And, you know, it better stop using it before it sends the release. But there's no good follow up text 
in the PD case about removing that prefix and possibly sending router advertisements out its interface that it put that prefix on, maybe with zero lifetimes or something like that. So it's a, it's a case that we should think about uh, trying to address. And the solution is that, you know, that's what it should do. It should send out RAs. If, if it was sending out RAs previously to advertise that prefix, it should send out RAs to um, remove that prefix by sending zero lifetimes. Comments from anybody? What's, the, people think this is a good idea to clarify this? I mean, it may be existing behavior, so it may not be an issue, but. Hey, hey Bernie, this is John Krasowski. Don't, don't we, do we have text for that, like somewhere else in some of the V6 drafts somewhere? Here come, yeah. Well, so 7084 covers the case of prefix change, but oddly doesn't cover this case, which is why this came up. It has text in there when you no longer, have, when you change your prefixes, when you use the old prefix, you should deprecate it. We don't say anything about the DHCP V6 release case, and this only came up recently. There's literally no text about this, which is where I was like, we should probably put it someplace. Yeah, I mean, I, I just thought I just thought we had we had generic text somewhere that pointed to how to deactivate a prefix, like on the on the customer land. But if we don't, then yikes. Yeah, I mean, I think I think probably you know it's one of those things that probably most implementers probably are doing, but it'd be good to make sure that you know we remind them that. But yeah, you better do this. Yeah, so like, should should we should we like write something down for like uh, V6 Ops or HomeNet, and then point to that in the biz when the releases? If if there if you can find text in some other RFC that we should point to. No, no, I'm the, oh. I'm, sa I'm I'm saying if if we can find it, great. If not, should we write something down and then point to that, right, to make sure that we have something like? Legit. Oh, I let them know about it. Yeah, because if, if it's it's a gap, it's not. And and I was just talking to Jason. It's like, well, does 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 that V6 plumbing belong in in a DCP? The definition that need to be that should be defined in, in a DC working group, right? Right. Wow. Go sit down, Ted Lemon. Um, so uh, actually, the I think the, probably the reason why some modems do this is because or some uh, CP devices do this is because they want to have a prefix for the local network, the home network. They don't want the home network to fail as soon as the, the PD dies. So um, I'm curious if you know, based on the products that you have, what they do for numbering IPv6 on the home network for inter-home inter network, intra-home network communication. Yeah, so Ted, so Ted what, we, what we would do, that, that's a good point. So what we, what we, we currently don't have ULA for the most part, uh, speaking at Chromecast. Uh, we could leave the delegated prefix hanging around, but what I think what we would do in e-router, right, in, in the tail up specs, is we would zero out the lifetimes. I'm sorry, we would turn off the uh, the default route. We would we would make sure that the default router has a zero lifetime, so that you're not trying to use it to get to the internet, right? Uh, that's that's a good point. Um, but again, hmm. this case here is a release. Okay, that might be a little bit different case than if you know the link to the CM or something is lost, right? To the cable network is lost. So this is, this is the specific case of the, the you know, the, the uh, router is sending right, right. a release. Right, so the, the alternate example would be like, if it expired right, and you still want to try to continue to use that prefix on a local LAN, you might zero out the default router lifetime, keep using the prefix until right. something new came along. I mean, maybe, you know, maybe the, maybe the text that we should have, I mean, you know, so there's the release case might be a little bit as I said, it might be a little bit different, but we might have text to say that, you know, again, this is, you know, in general, this is what you want to do. But there may be cases, you know, there could be in cases, other actions you might take, like, I'm not, I'm not sure we would put those in, but, so, you know. I, I, Ted Lemon, I think that the right place to actually address this question is V6Ops. I think the correct answer is you should use, use ULA for keeping your home network alive, but yeah. maybe there's some reason why that's not being done. I don't know. Um, yeah. I, I it just this this is a horrible kludge, which is totally understandable. But we really ought to say what you ought to do so that people stop doing it. Yeah. So, um, oh, can I? Oh, <laughs> make sorry. a comment about that. Um, so, 
but I'm the meta tier. Um, I don't have a particular opinion about the proposal itself, but uh, uh, I have a comment about the for example part. Um, so just sending an RA with the preferred lifetime being zero does not necessarily invalidate the prefix for for the uh, receiver of the RA. So, uh, Right. Yeah, and still, um, according to RFC 4862, um, the host is allowed to use um, the configured address for at least two hours, even if receiving uh, lifetime zero uh, prefix information option. So it, it will be a bit tricky. Not, yeah, so we not have to look at probably very critical for in the context of study 350 bs but uh, I'd like to just note that. Uh, so just to add to what uh, Jinmei said, like uh, there's also like a uh, denial of service prevention built right. into this. So like even if you send it with zero, it's not going to actually set it to zero. Right. Yeah, and that that's the whole. I mean, that is an issue here is that it could be a denial of service attack. Um, Alex Patrescu, to add one more thing, there is also router lifetime parameter, the one between zero and ninety nine ninety nine seconds which qualifies the router as capable to act as a default router or not. So when the prefix is disappearing, will the router still act as a router for the hosts in the home network or not? Yeah. yeah. And um, so there's another issue about a DCV a uh, V6 client should send a DHCP V6 renew for a given address if a router advertisement received with his lifetime of zero. So this is the case of, you know, and, and this is, I guess, a, you know, it's like a reconfigure my, my LAN or something like that case, right? Um, you, could, you could think of this almost, right? So it's, it's sort of the, the corollary of the other thing where, you know, if you gave out, so if, if the, CP did a release of the prefix. It was a DHCP server. It might then, you know, send out the RAs of zeros, and so all the clients that got leases from the server should re should do a renew, trigger renew. Now there is, you know, there is. It, it, it can be a denial of service or a, uh, you know, a a attack on both the clients and server. Um, and so there probably needs to be some text in there to, you know, recommend rate limiting and other things. But this is just a, we, we thought about this issue and we'd like the working group's input as to whether we should do anything about it. Uh, Suresh Krishnan, I just don't understand this. Like, uh, I think partially because uh, it says lifetime, but it's very ambiguous about what lifetime it is. Is it like router, li like router lifetime? Is it the oh, prefix the, lifetime? The prefix. Prefix in the PIO, the prefix information option, right? Okay, so how does that relate to a DHCP v6 client? The PIO is used by. Okay, so you are a CPE gets a prefix assigned to it, right? And then it starts sending out on the local LAN, right, in your home, sends out prefix advertisements, you know, PIOs in the RA. Yes. Okay, now the prefix either that it got delegated either expires or is released. And, you know, which was the previous issue, that's when we're saying send out these PIO options with zero lifetime, okay. and we're recommending that the clients use that as a trigger if they've got a, if they were delegated, if they were assigned an address within that prefix, you know, because the prefix length is, is available in the PIO, then they would trigger a renewal from the DHCP server. But this is a client, right? So the, the client who found the address out of the RA is like probably a Slack client, well, if, right? If, right, if it did Slack, then it's not gonna send a reconfigure. Okay. If it did, if it used DHCP v6 to get an address, then we would want it to do this. So this is like for the online determination, it's sending the PIO and, and this, you got the address using DHCP. Right. Okay. I mean, most of the, I think most of the, the home gateways these days use Slack, so this doesn't apply, right? At least not this piece of it. All right, that's it, and we're like three minutes over, I think. Yeah, so uh, apologies to Lu Yuan. Unfortunately, we ran out of time, so yeah. Uh, th that's it for today. Thank you, everyone, and thank you. see you on the mailing list, and hopefully see you in 
Buenos Aires. Gracias. Wow. 